All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Up and In Show. We are here on the purple couch at Cards and Culture with my guy Kramer. Appreciate you, dude. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. If you guys don't know Kramer Robertson, this guy is a stud, uh, major league baseball player, former LSU baseball player, um, played in Omaha, no national championship. Got to it. To it. To it. Not good enough. And were you on the 17 team? Yeah. That was one of my favorite teams to watch, though. Um, so if you guys are LSU fans, first of all, thank you guys for following, listening, subscribing. If you guys have not, would love that. Appreciate it. Um, but yeah, dude, thank you. I know you're busy. Uh, you just started workouts, huh? Yesterday. Sore as fuck. Yeah, dude, I can't, <laughs> I can't even move today. I was walking up here limping. That's the worst. It's, it's like, like the like best worst months. feeling. It's like the best because you know you're about to start training and getting back into it. It's but just, like, yeah, it's the sucks. getting back to it that's hard. It's not once you're in the, the routine of it and, and doing it, it's fun. It's just that first week back you dread so much. Yeah, that's the worst. And I feel like for me, throwing, it was like throwing. It was like, it feels like the ball feels yeah. weird for you. I'm sure it's lifting movements. You're like, fuck, this sucks. Just everything's tight. Yeah, everything's tight. Yeah. Well, good, man. We're going to dive into it. Um, you had a hell of a year. You know, the last couple Pro Bowl years have been, uh, you know, for me as a baseball player, I've been in that world. I kind of understand the things that happen, but I think for a lot of people, they don't. So I really, I'm excited to dive into that, talk a little bit about the mental side of that, some of the actual things that, you know, I probably don't even know that went on in your life that are, that are kind of crazy that I'm sure people would appreciate. Um, and we'll dive in a little bit about your story, how you got to LSU. Um, we'll talk about the GOAT, Kim Mulkey as well. Um, but yeah, talk to me a little bit about your upbringing and kind of where you're from and kind of introduce yourself to everybody a little bit. So I was actually born in Ruston, Louisiana, when my mom was still right. at Louisiana Tech. So I was there for five years. And the only memories I have there are just playing with a ball, whether it was a basketball, football, baseball, throwing the football in the front yard with my dad. We didn't have all these toys and the iPads and everything <laughs> else that kids have today. My sister and I just had balls. Yeah. That's, that is it. We would just go out in the yard and play. Uh, I think that's that's where the whole love for sports started. It was never, you know, I wanted to be a baseball player. I wanted to be a basketball player, football. I just wanted to play. Whatever season it was, that, that's what I did. And then we, when we moved to Texas, uh, it was a little bigger city, bigger schools. Um, and that's where I got started with my first team sport, which was soccer. And it, it just took off from there. Soccer. Were you good? I was good. My mom made me quit for Little League Baseball. Really? Well, at least good. that worked out. Like, well, it worked out well. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm but you glad love you soccer. For it's seven yeah. and eight years old. <laughs> Do you I, like it now? Because I feel like no. people love soccer now. I don't. I don't keep up with it. Yeah, anymore. me either. Like, yeah. Once I once I quit and focused on baseball, then soccer. I never thought about soccer again. Yeah. But yeah. played all three sports all the way through high school. Soccer, basketball, no. baseball, or basketball, football? baseball, football. Gotcha. And then once I got to high school, football was my was my sport. Really. Football was my best sport. It was my favorite sport. My dad played college quarterback at Louisiana Tech. So gotcha. Okay. I always thought I was a better football player, but I'm really? not very big. So, What position? Quarterback. Quarterback? Yeah. yeah. Um, where'd you grow up? What part of uh, Texas you grew up in? Waco. Waco. Nice. So okay. Obviously where Baylor is. Right. and Good place to grow up. Um, and I got to see my mom take a program that was absolutely nothing. Had never reached the NCAA tournament. And then, obviously, 20 years later, what it had become. So that was... That was cool. I got to experience a lot of things growing up that a lot of kids uh, wouldn't. Also yeah. had an, probably unfair pressure and a microscope on me that other kids didn't. So uh, that's interesting. Know, there was good things about it. There were bad things about it, but I wouldn't trade any of it. I mean, I remember being 10 years old and being in the Oval Office with President Bush at the time <laughs> that's or him, him coming to her game. So stuff like that was really cool. But yeah. when it came to like, I, could, I had no leash to get in trouble, go to parties, anything like that. So some give and take, but I wouldn't trade my upbringing with, with my parents uh, and my sister for anything. I love that. I love that. Um, I didn't know that when she took the job at Baylor, it was like that it was like she's resurrecting or creating a program. That's so wild. Yeah. So she had never been a head coach. She was, uh, she grew up in Hammond and then went to Louisiana tech and then was an assistant coach there for 15, 16 okay. years. And she okay. was supposed to be the next head coach. Gotcha. And she couldn't come to an agreement with the athletic director. She wanted a five-year contract, yeah. and he was only willing to give her a four-year contract. So she didn't budge, which is so Kim Mulkey, yeah. if, <laughs> if you know her. Yeah. Uh, she didn't budge, and she took the next job that offered, which just happened to be Baylor, who had never wow. made the NCAA tournament. So mm -hmm. it was her first co head coaching job uh, with, a, with probably the worst program in the country. Yeah. 
Holy shit. I did not know that. I love, <coughs> I absolutely love hearing. This is why I like doing the podcast, yeah. man. It's because like, you know, we've been friends. We crossed paths for, right. I don't know, five, six, seven years. I've, I know your mom from a distance, met her a few times, you know, but you don't know those intimate, intricate details. So right. um, what do you, that's so crazy. Like, what do you think, what do you think you pulled from that that you would say, you know, for going from that to 20 years later, seeing it, what do you think is the biggest thing that you noticed or saw? she didn't change at all from when it was the worst program in the country to when it was a dynasty and they were yeah. winning national championships and won, I don't know, 12 straight big 12 ch championships. Yeah. Um, she never changed. She was the same person, ran practices the same way, was the same person at home. So that's what I really took from her is like Love no matter that. how low she was or how big she was on the national stage, like she was just Kim. And so that's what I, I've tried to implement into my life. And, and I took a lot from that. I think you do a great job of it, man. It's been it's been really fun for me as as an older you know older player to watch younger players come through and um, you know in your world you guys had social media and it was crazy. You were a fan favorite, a ton of followers. You had I, you probably still do have more followers than most big leaguers, you know. And, and I don't just it's crazy how that goes and stuff. So for you to say that that was the piece that you pulled, right? Like I'm sure that helped you during that time. Yeah, she. You know, when she coaches and she's still like this, she's unapologetically herself. Yeah. So that's kind of how I played. Yeah. Like, some people are going to really like it and some yeah. people are going to really dislike it. But, yeah. like, I'm just going to do what makes me happy and play the only way I know how, which was in, with enthusiasm. That's the same way she coaches. Yeah. You either, she's a lightning rod. Like, you either love Kim Mulkey or you probably don't like her at all. <laughs> and I felt like at some point at LSU, I was, it was kind of the same way for me. I mean, I, it didn't bother me either way. Like, yeah. I just want to do out and have exactly. fun. Exactly play with play with my teammates and I love playing for LSU yeah and I just wanted to have fun while I did it man I love hearing that I really do and and again as you get to know people you see them from a distance right and and until I got to know you that's how I saw you was from a distance and it's fun uh, to kind of unpack those things and, and see how you learned a lot of your behaviors and stuff um would you say she was more influential than your dad or was it pretty equally kind of grown up they were influential in in different ways they got divorced when I was 10 so that was obviously uh really difficult for me and it was a it was a bad age but um when it comes to like my personality and what you see uh that's I mean that you look at the sideline that's that's yeah. all Kim Mulkey but yeah um my dad did a lot of things behind the scenes like he's he's the person who was coming home probably first because my mom was coaching and he was taking me in that backyard and throwing me batting practice or t he taught me how to throw a football. So stuff like that. a lot of the skills that yeah. I learned were based on my dad, just putting in the time with me. I love that. He put so much time when I was a little kid uh, with, with sports and everything. And as did my mom, but my mom was recruiting doing right. so much. It was, it was more difficult, but um, funny story that my mom used to catch my bullpen. She would sit on a bucket. Oh, I love that. Up until I was I love that. about 12, 11, 12 years old. When that. you start growing a little bit. Yeah. I was having a pitching lesson and the guy who's giving me the lesson is not catching me. He's yeah. standing by me on the mountain and my mom's on a bucket <laughs> with my catcher's mitt catching it. And I let one rip in the dirt and he drilled her in the shin. No, she threw the glove and said, never again. <laughs> That's when she drew the line. And she's never played catch with me since then. I love that. She was a, she was a baseball player growing up. She didn't play softball. She was the first girl to ever play little league baseball. What? Fact checked it. No yeah. way. She played Little League Baseball and made the All-Star team. That's painful. Hammond, I love that. So, yeah, look that up. Yeah, well. that's, I mean, that doesn't surprise me, though. Like, she, you just edit to her know, resume. She knows what she's doing. Yeah, 100%. You but get to you, a started certain, getting bit, yeah. you start getting to a certain point. Like, you're 12 years old. You start throwing a little bit harder, and it's close distance. Yep. And she was like, yep, yeah. it's time. I think I had a moment with that with my dad, too. Like, he just caught one ball. Like, it was when ball started running a little bit, yeah. right? And he, my dad wasn't a great baseball player, but um, good enough. But he caught it the wrong way and he literally threw it down started screaming fuck fuck and i'm like i'm like that's like i'm not mad at you i just i'm done i'm not doing this that's anymore exact, that's exactly <laughs> how it went and, and i had an older sister too mckenzie that played for my mom at baylor uh she was three years older than me so uh she was always way bigger she's really? as big as i am now i mean oh she's God. she's tall so yeah for a girl and so she would just always beat up on me i could never beat her in any <laughs> sport and she obviously went on to have a great career as well in high school and college yeah but just like the combination of all of the people that I had influence in my life. And I was fortunate to grow up with a lot of great little league coaches, great high school coaches in every sport. So I was really blessed with the people around me to become what I became. So I owe a lot of that to them. I love that. But yeah, I, you know, my immediate family, they really pushed me hard and they never, they never made me do anything I didn't want to do. Yeah. 
But if it was something I wanted to do, they supported, supported. it wholeheartedly, and they weren't easy on me. I'll yeah. tell you that. My mom is, you know how hard she is, but yeah. even playing, you know, backyard games against my sister, she used to beat, <laughs> she used to no beat up. up on me all the time, bro. <laughs> all the time. I love that. I love hearing that. And, and to me, like, that's what makes somebody a competitor, right? Yeah. Like, that's what's ingrained in you. You see it from your mom, your dad, whatever. Um, but, like, it's the backyard games. It's all that shit. It's the yeah. competitive nature. It's the bullying a little bit that creates your character to kick back and fight back a little, you For know? Sure. I love that. Um, so talk to me a little bit. Obviously, you, you kind of touched on it a little, being disciplined and, and having this kind of stuff. But what was the structure like and, and going through the high school rec recruiting process? You played all three sports and stuff, wound up going to LSU. But how did it, how did it unfold for you growing up throughout high school? Um, so by my sophomore year of high school, I was, um, I was playing all three varsity sports. And in Texas, the schools are it's big, a yeah. big public school. Like, it's not easy to do. So I, it's all I knew, though. People would always ask me, how are you doing this? Like, how are you playing three sports, going one sport to the other to the yeah. other? And then all summer, you're, you're doing seven-on-seven seven football with baseball and, you know, still doing fo football workouts in the morning. And I was like, it's just all I did my whole life. Yeah. I didn't know if I was you tired. And you don't know any different. Um, and then – after my sophomore year ish is when you, we went to all those uh, tournaments, East Cobb and all of that, where teams uh, started to take a notice. And I, I was fortunate to have um, a, a good travel ball team, good coaches, good people around me to where I started getting recruited by these schools. Uh, and then eventually I narrowed it down to Baylor, which I was never going to go there. I just said it. Texas A&M, who was the first school to ever start recruiting me, I really liked their coaching staff. They had uh, Rob Childers at the time. Uh, Justin Seeley was a recruiting coordinator. Ole Miss with Bianco. Nice. LSU. Nice. And so I had my – in between my football games, my my junior year of high school, my mom would come with me on recruiting trips. And so we went to Baylor. She didn't come with me on that one. But when <laughs> she went with me to A&M, yeah. she actually flew us private to Ole Miss, which was, I just – looking back, I just <laughs> – I cringe at so bad, bro. You didn't know any better. I, I didn't know any yeah, better. It was just normal. Like, that was my that was my life. I didn't think. Yeah. Like, wow, we got a recruit coming in on a <laughs> private jet. <laughs> they would probably loved it. They didn't have to pay for they anything. It was nice. any, but this is unofficial, so they weren't having to pay for anything anyway. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. We just find your own travel there. Right, right, right. I remember, like, I don't know if it was Bianco or it was uh, Godwin was the recruiting coordinator at the time. It's awesome. That's so awesome. Uh, I don't remember who I was talking to, but I, they were asking if I have, if we're driving in, if I have a way in, if I need to, they need to pick me up at the airport or anything like that. <laughs> I was like, oh no, it's all right. My mom got us a plane. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, say Dude, that again. Just totally <laughs> innocent, bro. Um, I love that. Enjoyed my visits to both places. A and M was a little country cowboy for me, and I, I didn't, I mean, you're 16 years old. You don't know who you are yet, but like I knew that wasn't really my yeah. personality. Yeah. But I love the coaching staff. Um, it's a great program. Then I went to Ole Miss and I was like, it's a great school. These girls are great looking. <laughs> they all look the same. They're all dressed the same. And the guy. How crazy is that? That they crazy. literally, it's like they walk around campus and you're like, they're all, they're literally the crazy. same. It's like cookie cutter girls. <laughs> but they're all good looking. And yeah. I remember. Beautiful. Beautiful girls. And the guys were wearing like just the short, chubby shorts whatever Sperry's whatever and all Sperry's. the glasses and, and i was like boat shoes i was like bro i don't know <laughs> uh, again i love bianco i love godwin the great program stadium was awesome i was like i don't know and then lsu was my last visit and uh i got here and javi was the assistant at the time i think this, this was like 2011 oh damn okay nice and i i went to the game like tyron matthew was still on the team I yeah think. yeah Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, that sounds right. Because when I was done in Pro Bowl, he was still there, I remember, my first year of Pro Bowl. Yeah, so I went on my visit to LSU, and I think that was the first beer I ever had. <laughs> I think it on was. On your visit. That's incredible. On my incredible. unofficial visit. Yeah. I think it was the first beer I ever had, and I was like, this was the first school where Javi said, hey, what hotel are you at? You at the, my mom got from it, like the Lod Cook or something. Yeah, yeah. Of course. And... <laughs> So cringe looking back on that. <laughs> uh, I feel like that's life, though. When you get older, that's what you realize is, like, everything you did was, cr like, you're yeah. like, God bless. <laughs> but Javi was like, hey, some of the guys are going to come pick you up. And it was Nola, Aaron Nola at the time, yeah. who was a freshman. Oh, wow. And uh, Tyler Moore, I think, was one of them. Okay. And then a couple other guys. And I don't know where they took me. I didn't know. It, yeah. it could have been Reggie's for all I know at the time. <laughs> um, 
But I remember getting a beer and like shaking because I didn't do that. Yeah, exactly. I didn't do it growing up because I was terrified of my yep. mom. Yep. She's back in the hotel sleeping. <laughs> I'm terrified drinking this like lime Bud Light. I'll never forget <laughs> it. <laughs> but after I left that visit, I was like, that's the place for me. Just that's like how you people, know. People, stadium, Coach Maneri was who. When I met with him the next morning, I was terrified. I remember meeting him for the first time. Yeah. Well, I went to a camp, actually, so it wasn't the first time I met him, but the first time talking to him one-on-one, like yeah. just us at the breakfast table. Hung just over. like <laughs> Just like shaking, yeah. like so nervous. And like to know Coach now is exactly. so funny to look back on how, how yeah. nervous I was. But um, yeah, once I went on that unofficial visit, I waited until football season was over. And um, I committed like January and since then, and so that was your sophomore year. No, I was junior. It was junior, after my okay. sophomore year, okay. into junior year. That's when they start. They started recruiting me, I believe, the summer after my sophomore year, yeah. and then it took me to January to to commit. Man. And after that, like, just finished my high school career and never looked back. But I had no idea what I was in store for. Yeah, no idea, dude. It's such a weird world, though, too. Now with <laughs> recruiting, like for you guys, like it's a different. I mean, it was only four or five years difference, but. I'm going to date myself here because there was no, I didn't have a phone in high school, so I couldn't text coaches, talk them, anything, you know, any of those loopholes that, that they that they do now. So like it was literally Jan or July one, my junior summer going into my senior year was the first time that I was allowed to talk to people. So I didn't go on any of my official visits till my senior year. Um, and I was raised very similarly. My dad and mom weren't coaches or anything like that, but they were very strict discipline. I never drank in high school, never partied, same thing. Right. So when I came to my visit, I didn't even drink. Never had, I didn't go on, I didn't have really? one drink on any of my visits my senior year. That's so, rare. Yeah, bro. I would, I would have been probably just, I would have shit myself. I wouldn't I was, have even I was sh shook. Dude, I was so nervous. I can't imagine. Now it's, it's funny looking back, like I'm sitting in Aaron Nola's freshman apartment, <laughs> having a beer with right. him. <laughs> now I'm watching yeah. him. Now looking at it. Series, yeah. it's crazy. Now you guys are both big leaguers. And it's like, it's so it's to me, that's the cool part, right? Like this, this past year, um, we had to go to um, New Jersey for there's a sports card convention up there. And so one day I took Jonah and Kylie, Kylie's um, grandfather was Roger Maris. Um, yeah, no big deal. Right. Um, so we went up there and it was just fun to go out and we saw DJ and went on the field with DJ. And then afterwards I went over his house and you're just like sitting there at his like stupid crit, you know, like we're sitting on the rooftop in New York city. And it's just like, bro, we were kids in college, like talking about saving money for our first Jordans together. You know what I'm saying? Like, and now, you get and now look at this. Yeah, exactly. Apartment. Yeah. So yeah. it's just fun to see it come full circle. And I'm sure it's the same for you and <laughs> all your boys. This is the fun part is yeah. all you guys are starting to get there now. Yeah. And it's like, Good you guys are establishing right yourselves and stuff. So, so yeah, I love that. Um, so talk to me a little bit about LSU. You get here. i um, trying to remember. So what was your first year? 14? The spring of 14. Okay. So did you immediately come in and play right away? I can't remember how th how that went. Dude, it took two it? years okay. of this. I love it. I love that. Not I, I mean, got it. It was awful. I did. I wanted to go home right after my first semester. What? Like, no, this is not it for chills, me. bro. Yeah, this is not for me. I'm coming home. Yeah, I went home for Christmas break. Didn't want to come back. I got here probably a lot. Of, like like I was saying, like I had no idea. Like this was just my life, mm -hmm. and I was just unapologetically myself, but bro, you, you know, you come in as a freshman, you got upperclassmen, Nate Fury's a senior. <laughs> it's, I think that would have been the worst thing for me ever. If Nate was that, a senior, it's like I was a freshman. that kind of senior class, my <laughs> freshman year. Who were some of the other seniors? Do you uh, remember? Sean McMullen. I mean, you had Christian oh, Ibarra was yep, a junior. Yep, yep. Um, Jerry Foster. Foster. Foster was there as a junior. Tyler Moore was there. Oh boy. Uh, Nola, it was Nola's junior year. There were some dudes that were like way above me and, so I roll up <laughs> day one of the meetings, like I'm, I'm telling myself, like I'm coming in, I'm going to start. Yeah. I'm going to be a dog. Oh yeah. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. <laughs> I love it. So I roll up day one and like a blacked out G wagon, uh, not G wagon, uh, blacked out Range Rover, like Versace shades <laughs> in the, to that first meeting. But I wasn't trying to right. like, it was be just an you. asshole. It was like, just you. That's what. I knew, and I didn't think anything different. I didn't realize, like, hey, we're we're freshmen in college. Like, we're in poverty right now. Let's, yeah. like, we're all in this together. Like, <laughs> and I roll up, and so I had, I was just oblivious to it. So yeah. it probably rubbed a lot of people the wrong way just day one of that first meeting. Like, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah. I love that. And then <laughs> having the Kim Mulkey over my head, like, they already knew yeah. all of that and had all of these – assumptions made of me before they ever even gave me a chance yeah. so my first month 
I didn't, nobody really even talked to me. Oh my God. And like at all, like they would got, even the freshmen like would go out and like, just, you weren't part of the freshman group. I wasn't group. part of the yeah. freshman group. You're excluded. I wasn't part of the main core group. I wasn't even part of like the outsiders Damn. for at least like six weeks. Wow. And so I was like Friday night in my room, locked watching TV and playing yeah. PlayStation yep. 3 at the time. Oh my God. So that was brutal. And so it took until like the end of the fall, like when we're having like our scrimmages and I play as well as I could possibly play. So guys, I don't know if it's for that or like just eventually the guys started giving me a chance. Yeah. And then that aspect, it was all good. Like then on I was, the field, everything was straight on the field. Everything was straight. But now off the field, by the end of the semester, like I had made some friends, like the guys were coming around. They, they liked me like, actually this is all right. He's, he's, he's cool. <laughs> we can bring him out a little he's bit. Cool. <laughs> he's cool. He's not so bad. Yeah. Um, but I still was so homesick. And then when I went home for Christmas break, I didn't want to come back yeah. at all. I did though. And Continued to play well. Didn't start opening day, but started the third game of the season. Played the best possible game I could play. So this is your freshman year. Freshman year. Nice. First career game, best I could play. Um, Sports Center top 10 play down the line. Let's okay. go. That was yeah. your freshman year? The one, it was, no, it wasn't the one in Houston. Okay, okay. that's what I'm thinking. I was about, at I second base. It was like down the right field line. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I'm like cloud nine. Yeah. Happiest I could be. Yeah. Uh, and then I, Basically earned the starting job, and then it was Purdue. I'll never forget Friday night. I'm leading off and strike out four times over four. Only time in my career, pro, college, high school, ever. Really, only four strikeout game over four four strikeouts in an error in like the oh top God. of the ninth that we that almost cost us the game. Yeah, and the next. So I guess, yeah, that was a Friday night. So the next day, Maneri calls me into his office. He said, hey, I need to talk to you. And freshman, like, I'm super insecure. Like, yeah. I'm not, like, you know how it is as a freshman. 100%. I'm, I'm thinking, all right, he's going to call me here, like, pat and say, hey, it's it's okay. Oh, boy. Like, you know, it happens. You're a yeah, freshman. You'll like, bounce back. Yesterday doesn't mean anything. Like, today, it's focus on today. <laughs> <laughs> Close the door. Sit down. Come here, Kamer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. You know, I've been coaching 32 years. <laughs> and your performance last night might have been the worst of all the performances I've seen in all of my years of coaching. <laughs> I don't even want to look at you. I don't even know if I'll ever push you back in the lineup. It made me sick to watch you play. Now get out. <laughs> That's it. That was the conversation. Bro. Bro, first of all, I'm sure. How many times did you fucking get ripped out by Maneri? Because that was fucking spot on. Oh, dude, dude, I think he will tell you this in his however 38 years of coaching, whatever he 40 years of coaching. You got his face down and everything too. Like I think I got it the worst for those first two those first two years. Cause he told me he that I might be the worst he's ever worst gone ever after. coached. Yeah, he's embarrassed but, that you he recruited you. He me, he's like it's embarrassing to look at you out there. <laughs> I was like, bro, I'm 19 years old. Like, my, I'm already, like, just yeah, not, not even knowing what's going on in my own mind. And to think that you're going in there getting a little pat on the ass, too. I you know? thought and I then, was yeah. and that I was going to be in the lineup. Bro, I sat for, like, a while. Oh, shit. A while. And I had played really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to coach's defense, I wasn't ready. Like, the whole, I think kids should play sport, different sports growing up, everything they can. I was behind when yeah, I got yeah. like the skill was there, but like experience reps, all the that the instincts, the just knowing what to do, the consistency was not there. And so my freshman year, I was in and out of the lineup. I started half the games, ups, downs, ugly, like made a game losing air at Florida, merry go round on the bases, like oh my god, <laughs> and had big hits. So it was um, it was a complicated year, but it, it, I learned a lot from it because it was the first time I had ever failed. Yeah. And so I went to the Cape Cod League and came back like I'm gonna be the guy this year. Yeah, Second yeah. base, Bregman's was at short. Like hmm. this is this is my year. Did everything right. Had a great preseason. Went into the season. Lost my job, like two weeks into the season. Then Damn. tore my elbow up and was out for the rest of the season. Uh, Got cleared to come back for Omaha. And coach was like, "If you can get cleared, like I'm taking you to Omaha." Yeah, yeah. I got cleared and. I'll never forget it was the day Bregman was drafted second overall. And they were leaving a couple days to go to Omaha. And he called me in the office. He's like, I know you're clear, but like, 
you haven't played in two months. Yeah. Like, we got to take guys that, that are ready to Damn. go. Like, I'm not taking you. Yeah. So then I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. And, I, like, I drove drive home to Waco, like, seven hours. Like, have to watch Bregman, who's yeah. experiencing everything that I want to experience right now. Yeah. He just got drafted. He's going to Omaha. And I'm the scrub driving home that I know I'm better than this. Like, right. I, nobody else, no LSU fan. Like, I was, like, the punching bag of LSU fan when social really? media started. Really? It was so bad. But it was fair. I wasn't very – I wasn't putting up numbers. Yeah. And – so I drove home seven hours pissed, like embarrassed, yeah, bitter at coach, like yep. hated him, man. Um, wow. Back to the Cape and had to make a decision if I wanted to come back to LSU for my junior year and try for the <laughs> third time. Right. And I'm super prideful, so I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm proving everybody, yeah. everybody, even my teammates, my coaches, the fans, like probably even my own family. Yeah. Well, there was times my mom told me, like, Get out. Right, right. Not good enough. Right. Transfer. Wow. I have the text messages saved. I love I'm that. Petty because I'm petty. <laughs> and I love that. So I come back junior year, work as hard as I possibly could, like just kept my head down. And uh, junior year, made first team All-SEC, second team All-American, and then obviously Was that 17? That was 16. Okay, 16. That's the year before. Nice. Okay. That's the year that Bregman was gone. Everybody right. was That's gone. Right. That's right. Um and we weren't supposed to be very good at all. Yeah. And we ended up being a national seed. And probably my, that was probably my best overall year. And so when I made All American, I sent my mom the screenshot of those, yeah. of those wasn't texts. Good. Yeah. Like, who's not good enough? Yeah, right. I'm pretty good, motherfucker. Like, I'm the best nine. I, t- I take <laughs> note. Like, I don't, I don't forget that stuff, even even family. Yeah. Um, that's hey, that's that chip on your shoulder that makes you the player who you are. You know had, what I'm saying? And that attitude, yeah. But people, I just think that people saw my junior year and – and senior, that the tip of that iceberg, they didn't see, dude, I failed so much. I went through so much to get to where I was just in college, like just to get to that point, to give mm-hmm. myself a chance at Pro Bowl. Because mm-hmm. after my sophomore year, Pro Bowl wasn't even on my radar yeah. because I was so bad. Yeah. So I stuck it out and it, it, and it worked out. And I, I think that you don't see a lot of that these days because of the transfer portal. You don't see, you know, if you don't get what you want right away, well, I'll just transfer. Exactly. Like, I think there's something to be said for waiting your turn developing i got to learn from bregman and everybody else in the infield that were that were so much better than me at the time yep. uh and i was better for it so i'm proud that i i stuck it out and and ended up having the success i did the last two years and i wouldn't have changed it i would i'm a better player today because of those first two years of not playing and and really having to learn learn the game and and be be mentally stronger than i was so uh, i wouldn't trade it for anything that's, I love hearing that because adversity builds character, right? Sure. Like, and everybody's got this fear of, not everybody, I should say, but there's, you know, a sense of fear of fail, failure in the world and in, in our sport, in our world, right? Like we're on a pedestal and all these things. So you're supposed to not fail, even though it's a sport of failure, right? right. So all that stuff taught you all these things. And um, in today's world of immediate gratification, I love hearing that shit. And everybody, right. like you said, probably lands on your page and they're like, oh, everything's been great for this guy his whole life. And here we are fucking being like, no, motherfucker, I wanted to go home. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't I, belong. I didn't feel like I belonged. I've never tried to hide. <clears throat> I was blessed that yeah. I'm blessed at who my mom is. I right. never, I never had to beg for anything. I was given every opportunity, not given yeah. every opportunity, but I was. Had every opportunity. I had every opportunity. <clears throat> I had privilege. I get all of that. But like I still had to go out there and earn it. Like when you're in between the lines, like it doesn't matter if your parents have X amount of dollars or you're flat broke, like it's you versus me. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that. Like, you know, just because I had, I don't want to say an easier path. I had things available to me. I never had to use the same glove. I get all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I had to work for what I for what I got, and I and I'm really proud of that. And no matter what what you come from, like. With Coach Mary, you got to, or anybody, like in baseball, yeah. you got to earn it. And I went through those struggles, and nobody saw that. Nobody saw that side. They just saw Kramer Robertson, success at LSU. His mom is this, while this kid's just been given everything in his life. Like, must must be nice. Heard that so many times. I'm like, you don't, you know, don't even know. You don't even, you don't even know how hard my mom was on me, how hard Maneri was on me, how hard my teammates were. I mean, Nate Fury, I wanted to kill that guy. <laughs> I can I, see if that. Nate's I can't watching, if Nate's watching this, <laughs> I still have a like such a grudge towards you because of my freshman year. Like you scarred me, scarred him, you scarred me. Nate. PTSD. 
It was awful. He was so mean. He, he still is no, mean. He's still mean. He's but still now a bully. I, but now I know. But I can, can you imagine mean. being a senior with a freshman? I can't imagine. I didn't know I could talk back to him. <laughs> Nate, was so, Nate Fury was so mean to me. I think Nate loves when you talk back to him, though. He likes that. Oh, he, he does. Likes, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, I, yeah, and, exactly. and the and more you don't yeah. talk back to him, the yeah, more he's just going to keep going. Bully. And I just wanted everybody to like me. Yeah. And so I was just would slump down. I think I tweeted like 10 years ago. I saw it recently. I was like, I hate. I hate Nate Fury. <laughs> and so I like every time, every year that I, it pops up on my, on my feed, I, I send it to him. I, like, so I still, I funny. still feel the same way. Yeah. <laughs> still but hate the, you motherfucker. <laughs> but Nate and I are good friends yeah. now, but he was so mean to me. Oh dude, I can imagine. I mean, that's, that's what makes good friends though too. Yeah. But I, I think too, something that you were saying is, you know, I was privileged in life too. I, I think my family was very poor middle class until I was about 12, 13, but that's right when you're playing ball and doing all these things, right? So I, I had an opportunity to go to a Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, private, right? And do things differently than some of the kids in my hometown. And so I was privileged the same way, but with that comes expectations. Right. And you, you have your own experience, right? The same way other people that don't have that opportunity have their experience and have their struggles. There's a mental side of this that, like you said, there's expectations, there's um, discipline. There's these things that you've just been, you know, pigeonholed into your whole life that make you who you are. But then also you got to deal with that shit. Your teammates know that they're going to rag you. Like there's like 100%. different adversity that you have to go through in that situation, you know, than others. Yeah. That's, that sounds bad. Like, wow, you're getting ragged on for having a nice car, but right. like, when you're a 17 year old, 18 year old kid that fucks with your head. I didn't know. It's and you didn't know what I got. Yes. Exactly. It's like, that's a cool car. Yeah. I was like, you can drive it. I used to let Bregman drive my car wherever he wanted throughout the city, which yeah. looking back, that's really dumb. Cause he, <laughs> he drove really fast, <laughs> but my mom did a really good job of growing up when we were growing up of keeping that from us. I had no idea that we had any more money than my friends. I'd go spend the night at their house. They'd come out to my house. I didn't have growing up anything more than anybody else. Yeah. If I needed a nice baseball bat or a glove, I got it. Right. But, but it wasn't like you were living this like flaunty. We like, didn't have yeah, a like, big house. Yeah. I mean, and she wasn't, granted, she wasn't making the money in 2006, 2007 right. that she is now, but I didn't know. And I didn't think of it, her as having a lot of money. I didn't think of my friends of not having a lot of money. My mom would take me um, for basketball. She would take me across the river uh, to play. And I was the only white kid in the league. And one of the best things she ever did for me sporting sports wise, because I went from being the best at every, in, in every league to, okay, well, these guys are a lot bigger and faster and better than me. Like, and it motivated me. And I remember yeah. playing, I said, some of my best friends to this day from those teams, yep. uh, we played high school basketball and football together. I love that. Uh, but she was just really good with that. Yeah. She never made us feel any different because we weren't right. And then, if I got a car, she got me a nice car when I came yeah. to college. It was a graduation gift. Like, yeah, I got a, a, a few things that that are nice, and I, I heard about it. Yeah, for sure, as you know. Yeah, but and, and that doesn't change, right? When you get to the – when I got to Pro Bowl and I was the first – or the top pick, right? I was the bonus baby, so, right. so same thing. Knew. And I was a 21-year-old kid, and it fucked with me. I was 20 when I first got drafted. Yeah. And it sounds terrible to be like, oh, you were rich, and, you, and that was your problem. Yeah, it was, actually. I had to go through the locker room, and everybody fucking ragged on me. Everybody expect me to pay bills. Everybody expect – and – don't get me, I'm not complaining, but it was my you. experience and it did fuck with me you a little bit. You just want everybody, to, you just want to be like everybody that's else and you, you want everybody, and you want everybody to like you. Exactly. And that's exactly how <laughs> I was coming into college. Yep. So you can imagine, I kind of went through the yeah. same thing in low A, right? Absolutely. When you're in the shitty locker rooms and, but I'm pulling up in a nice car or whatever, right. right? All these different things and everybody's like, it has that same view. So I under, I do think I understand it a little bit. I might not understand because I think at 17, 18, it's probably even harder because you're, you just want to be accepted even more, you yeah. know? I had a little bit of an identity at 2021, 20, a little bit more. Um, but I, I, I would imagine that that's a struggle. Yeah, it was. And I just, I'm the type of guy that I don't like to have any enemies. I just like to, have, I just like to be friendly with everybody. You're a lover, bro. And I hate when people that are in my circle, like don't like me or don't want to be around me. Yeah. So that, that hurt my freshman year when, yeah. when none of the guys liked me at all. Yeah. No, it's not a good feeling to be, ex I mean, it's a basic human need, right? Yeah. To be accepted into the community. And, and when you get to college, you've been waiting this for your whole fucking life oh, and you don't dude. get accepted by the boys. Dude, I couldn't even get a girl to talk to me at all. My head was shaved. Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Dude, <laughs> uh, I didn't talk. I don't think I talked to one girl, got one girl's number oh my, my entire yeah. freshman fall. It was wow. that, it was that bad. Yeah. Like I was the dork of the team. Yeah. I, I, sh I didn't, I don't know if I was like struggled like that, but I struggled the, I was, came from New Jersey. Right. So I was like homesick. Yeah. I didn't understand the culture here. That was my biggest thing was like, 
I don't know, in Jersey, it was like, we weren't as nice and outgoing and like, not that that was a bad thing, but I was always like kind of over my shoulder, like, what do they want from so me? Like, yeah, yeah, it was just different. So that, I struggled with that a little bit. Um, and I remember my, I remember Thanksgiving, I wanted to come home and my dad was like, my mom wanted me to come home. She hadn't seen me in three months. The first time that we were separated for three months, she called me and she was like, you can come home. We'll call a flight. We'll, we'll get a flight for you. And I was like, okay. I start packing my stuff. My dad calls me back two minutes later. He goes, I know your mom just told you to come home, but you're not coming home. You're staying there. You need to stay at school. Like this is part of growing up and being away. Like he was in the mil, you know, went in the military and all this shit. And he's like, it's okay. You're not, you don't need to come home. You're going to be fine. You're going to go to dinner with coach Maneri. You don't need your family today. This is part of your life. And I remember That's sitting hard. in my fucking laundry room, like almost cr like literally crying and shaking and being like, why don't they fucking want me to come home? You know? And yeah. I found out later, my mom and dad got into a huge fight about that. My mom was like crying, like he should come home. He needs to be loved. Like, you know? And my dad was like, no, he needs tough love right now. To yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and looking That's back hard. on it, it was funny. Cause I was what Thanksgiving, which is November by December. I didn't want to come home for, really? for winter break. Yeah. It was like that quick where I was like, I fucking love it here. It's crazy that you remember that because I remember the first time that I was like, I don't want to go home. Yeah. was my sophomore year. Like, it was like fall break. And yep. I don't even really want to yeah. go home. Like, I love it here. Yep. This place is sick. I don't think I went home. I think I, w I think I went home for that Christmas, but I don't think I went home for Christmas again for two the two years that I was in college because I took some winter classes and then it was like DJ was from Michigan. So he would, I think he would go home for like one or two days and then he would come back the same way. So we would just hang out and do our thing and... Yeah, it was fun. It was like once you start getting accepted and getting with the boys and shit, that was like the best part. It's no no place like it yeah. here, bro. I love it. Was that a big factor in why you stayed for your senior year? It was because I loved it so much here, one. And two, I never got to go to Omaha. So my sophomore year. I love that. We, yeah. lo we lost yeah. in the regional my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, coach decided not to take me. And then junior year, we lost at home to Coastal Carolina on a walk-off. That's walk -off. right. Oh, my God. You guys were the national seed, right? And that, Were yeah. you guys a national seed? Yeah. yeah. And Coastal went on to win the national championship. So I was like, man, I really, unless it's like a lot of money. Yeah. So I said top five rounds or top five round money, which yeah. I think was like 550. And I think the highest offer I got was maybe like 250 or yeah. three. I don't remember exactly what it was. And God, that's such a that hard was, I don't know, that was like late first round. Like, yeah. will, you, will you accept this if we draft you here? And I was like, yeah, nah, I'm straight. Yeah. I'm good. So I had a bunch of offers from like round seven, 11, 15. Yeah. And I'm straight, I'm straight. And then Coach Mary, never forget it. <laughs> Great. Is it true you turned down $250,000? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Coach, I'm coming back. He's like, well, of course I want you back. I just, I want to make sure that you're making, that you think you're making the right decision. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, coach, I'm straight. We're going to come back and win a national championship and everybody else is going to come back too. Let's go. And so I, I was the first one to come back and I was, and, uh, I think Cole, who, who was it? It was me, Dykeman. Dykeman no, Dykeman right? was yeah. next. And I was with Dykeman. I'm like, bro, you're only a sophomore. You're never going to go to Omaha. Like, come yeah. on, come back for one more year. You'll yeah, be yeah. the first rounder. Let's yeah. go. And he's like, yeah, I'm coming back. Oh my and God, then, I love that. Cole, once we came back, like, Cole's got the worst FOMO of anybody I've ever met, so he's not going to, he's like, well, I got to come back now. For My sure. friends are still there? My I'm friends are still there. there. <laughs> I'm for sure coming back. Yeah. And Poche was the last one. We thought there was no chance. That's right. I forgot um, about that. Yeah. He was like ninth round. Like, yeah. He had three great years. So yeah. I'm like, bro, you ever think about coming back? <laughs> yeah. He's like, nah, bro, I'm gone. Yeah. Like, we just got to get the logistics of it worked out. Yeah. I'm like, Kept going on longer and longer. And they're calling me, bro, what you thinking? Planting seeds, baby. What you thinking? He's like, bro, I don't know. They changed their offer. Like, and I was like, just come back. <laughs> and he's like, bro, I'm not coming back. Just and they just kept slowly building and building. And finally, he was like, all right, I'm coming back. Like, they're That's not going to so match. Awesome. They're not going to give me the offer I want. Yeah. I'm coming back. And so when he, when I knew he was coming back, I was like, oh, this team's about to be crazy. Yeah. This team's going to be so good. And that was going into Lang's junior year, right? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, that was going into Lang's junior year yeah. at 17. Antoine's sophomore yeah, year. He yeah. just came off like the All-American yep, freshman yep. year. Um, that team was loaded. Hess was just emerging, right? Or Hess, was, not, a, he'd no, be Hess emerging. was a true freshman. That's right. That's we right. He had him. Yeah, we, didn't, we knew he nothing about emerged. Watson, yep. Hess. We didn't even know about those guys. Yeah. We had the Jordan twins coming back. We had Papirski. Yep, yep, yep. Um, wow. Dude, we were about to be. The team is fucking loaded. Poche, Lang, we were about to be loaded and we knew we were good yeah it was like th th i think there's so many similarities to the 2009 yeah. and the 2017 team just besides the fact that y'all won it y'all finished it and we didn't like that team was so close and we had so much fun and 
we were cocky. We knew we were good. Yeah. We Maneri knew we were good, so he was pretty much relaxed the whole the whole yeah. fall, the whole season. Like I was, was out in Korea watching that. Like, bro, I was the fuck the biggest fanboy. Like, I was like, so I love this team. Like, I don't know. I just wanted you guys to win so bad because same thing. It reminded like me of us and like the way that we and the same way i think when we were playing right like we would watch the 97 world uh team and we were like that's what we want to be like you know like all that shit so we were like i know a lot of us felt that you guys probably embodied and that we had the influence of that 09 team micah gibbs was our hitting coach that's right and chinko <laughs> was our first <laughs> base coach that's bro. right that's right so like the culture nolan yep. nolan was our third yep. base coach yep. 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 bro so the culture of javi was javi still there was no, he gone? Javi's gone. gone okay javi's gone because uh canizero just left so that's right that's right Coach is like in panic mode that fall, like looking for a coach from her, like, no, just okay. promote Nolan, promote yeah. uh, Micah, and and just Sean's just here, Sean, too. Yeah. And Sean's here, too. And he's like, really? <laughs> I was like, just do it. Just like, do like it. we don't mess up what we got. We got yeah. a good thing going here. And he's like, oh, well, screw it. Okay. <laughs> 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 so he hires him, bro. So that's our staff, oh which God. is crazy. Yeah. And we had the, the players and like, we would go hang out with Micah and yeah. Chink and everybody. I remember that's and, how I yeah. met you guys. Was you like guys, yeah, and we like during just like the <laughs> culture of that team. Man, yeah. I've never been on a team like that one. Yeah, bro. That, yeah that was just to where we were that good and that close and had that much fun. Yeah, and we're just all so cocky all at once, <laughs> but like in the best way. Yeah, and exactly. Just didn't care. Like we were the villains of the <laughs> SEC that year, and so we were like, oh, we might as well just you know, feed into this and like play into it. Like that's our role. Like let's just embrace being the villains. Yep. And, like if they want to hate us, let's really, let's make them hate us. Yeah. I love and that. And then it was like, Kramer, <laughs> you're going to make it like you do this. <laughs> like you're the, you're, you're captain douche this year. Yeah, so you're you, going to be the face. You're you, going to you do, do it. This. Do the blonde hair. Do, do the blonde all everything. Hair. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, I'm like, I'll do it. But I mean, it just was so not my personality. Like some of the stuff, like I'm so low strung, just chill. And we were just the opposite of that, just like throwing stuff across the dugout, yeah. like jumping up and down, fist bumping. Like, yep. that's what you had to do. Like, I remember it's part of the reason I was interested in LSU is watching you guys in 2009, like watching yeah. Mikey score and like yep. tackle people in the dugout. Yeah, like we were crazy. Crazy. I remember the game before, I remember it was the, um, we were in Omaha. Chris McGee, Chris McGee literally has the, the picture framed in his house because, and him and I, every, like, it was our thing when we were out at bars drunk and shit. We would always just be like, and so I remember being on the bus. I was going to pitch against Arkansas. This was the game to get us into the championship series. And I remember um, going up to Nick Poneff, McGee, and Buzzy and being like, yo, I'm fucking exhausted. But I'm like, not like today. I meant like my arm is dead. You know, like yeah. I need you guys in the dugout. I need you guys pumping me up. When I strike somebody out and coming off the field, I need y'all motherfuckers like coming up to me, fucking pumping me up. And so sure enough, like they were fucking choking me, hitting me. It was like, it was like football players coming off. I'm like, come on, hit me. Let's go buzzy. And that. it was like, I never was like that. I never played football. I played basketball and I was kind of like a, a shit talker, but I was never like rah, rah, like intense, right. you know, like, but there was something here with this team and that stadium and shit. That was nuts. I loved it. That's how, that's how it was with us. Like just, <clears throat> just intensity, passion. And it really wasn't fake. Like we really were that into it. Like, I think back to um, the Mississippi State game. We had a super regional here. Like, I look back at the replays of that, and, like, I don't remember any, like, doing any of this stuff that I, the antics I was doing. Like, <laughs> people are scoring. I'm, like, my eyes are this big. <laughs> I'm, like, screaming. My hair's out here. I dude, I have pictures where I'm just, like, what am I doing? Like, the veins in my neck, I'm screaming, and I'm, like, dude, it it's was. the most fun I've ever had. Yeah, 100%. percent It's so fun. You don't get that in Pro Bowl. Every, that's you what I was. Don't get It was that. literally, like, completely different as soon as you get there. Like, uh, you want to hear fun, some funny story? I remember, so 2011, um, so I was drafted in 2010. I was the first round pick. Second round pick was um, Brandon Workman, and the third round pick was this kid named Sean Coyle, who was a high school kid. Signed, He got a big signing bonus to not go to – um, North Carolina, but we all got assigned to low A, right? So we're all, and Brandon and I, Brandon's 6'5", I'm 6'7", Sean is 5'6", uh, he was a second baseman, like a little little guy, but he had pop, like big pop, and he hit a bunch of homers. So he hits his first home run, and I remember Brandon and I like getting up on the top step, and we were like, kid, kid! When I tell you, Coyle wasn't even at second base, that was his nickname we called him, our third base coach beelined over from third base coach, came over and points at Brandon and I go, sit your fucking asses in the dugout. We don't play this college bullshit here. This is fucking pro ball. He's supposed to hit a home run. Sit your fucking ass down. And we were like, okay. oh boy, this is, this is a lot different. different. We ain't supposed to do that. So that was my like, 
all right, cool. Yeah. There's no emotion. We don't do this here. This is, this is different. It so. sucks. Yeah. It sucks because that's what. I'm like, bro, how are you supposed I to make this from, fucking 30 people in the stands fun? Like, there's, you know, like, this is this is terrible. I went from, I mean, you did too. Like, I went from Omaha, playing for a national championship, like, yeah. f- living and dying by every pitch to a week later, I'm in Cedar Rapids, <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> Trying and, to get pumped up. And it just, it's 38 hard. people. You have, to find, f- yeah. you have to find different ways. And now I've been in it long enough to where I've adjusted, but. I don't even remember what it's like like to get excited for another person getting a double. Right. I don't even get that excited when I hit one because right. it feels like you're always just chasing numbers. And you're always, you got to do it again. You got to right. do it and again. I gotta, okay, I hit a double. Cool. What am I going to do next? I got to go steal it. second or third base and do this. <laughs> but it's like, maybe when you get to the big leagues, it gets it gets back to that. Yeah. Like where you're excited and you're like, I don't care if I go over four today or four for four. Like if I do my job, like I, I did, right. like nobody can see you know, from a numbers, like what kind of player you are. Um, if I got the guy over, it's just an out. Right. If I got the guy in, it's an RBI, but it counts against your own base. And you're at, like, it's hard. That's why pro balls is just frustrating for me because you don't get the full, you can't see the full package of a player by just looking at their numbers and their analytics. Yep. Like you can't see the intangibles from that. You can't see if a guy's a winner until he's in – the last 40 games of the season chasing the postseason or in the postseason, right? That's bullshit. I totally agree. You don't even see a competitive, like as a pitcher, right? In a fucking April game, I'm just competing against myself and hopefully to stay on the team. You know right. what I'm saying? It's not that we're trying to get this win to get to the next level or whatever. It kind of sucks. Yeah, I mean, I get it because it's it's what teams have won with, the strategy they've won with, with the analytics and, and all of that, and you're going to fall in love with the home run ball and the power and the big guy that passes the eye test, but... <laughs> I'm watching the playoffs and I'm watching some of these guys and put up really bad at bats, strike out three, four, five times in a game. And, and you know, guy in second tie game, the sixth inning, two outs and like taste swinging for the upper deck. And I'm yeah. like, this is what Maneri instilled in me here, man. Like this is when I want to be up to bat. And I'm going to find a way to, yeah. to get this, put this ball in play and give, give us a chance to get a yep. base hit here. Um, so it's, that's the f- most frustrating part about pro ball with me is, is it's hard for them to measure, you know, the intangibles and the heart of a player, how much of a winner you are, because they don't really take that into consideration until you're actually in the big leagues and they see it. Exactly. And so that's – and I've seen it with a couple of my friends that have gotten – like weren't big prospects, got to the big leagues, and now they're there because they have it. Exactly. They have the it factor. Um, so I'm just hoping for that opportunity where I can get up there and stick. And Because I know once I'm there, yeah, there will be a team that will appreciate my skill set and my value that I bring because it's not just like the graded power, the graded arm, the graded bat, everything speed. There's more to baseball and there's more to sports than, than, than numbers and what's, and what somebody else said about you. I couldn't agree more. And that's why I was like, I, that's the one thing about the analytic era that I don't like is you saw it in the playoffs, right? Like, when Gosman came out, Nola came out. There was a couple times, and I'm a little emotional to those guys because they're LSU right. guys, but, like, you want to see those guys get out of it. And if you're watching the game, you're like, oh, he's going to strike this guy out right now. But it's like, oh, the front office said that, you know, this matchup's actually better, so we're going to bring this guy in. It's out of my hands, you know, and you're like, what the fuck? Like, that's not baseball. And analytics are good <laughs> in, in certain spots. I like analytics in sports. And, yeah. like, in basketball, like, why it doesn't make sense for you to shoot a two-pointer a foot in front of the three-pointer. Right. Either shoot it right. there or get closer to the paint. It makes it makes sense, but just overall, like whatever happened to like the old school pulmonary Kim yep. Mulkey? Like, I want a winner. Yeah, like he that player can pass the eye test all day and they can put on a show in BP, and they might hit forty homers in a season. But like, what happened to wanting the players that are yeah. winners and that? Glue guys, guys like that. Like I just, you don't see that many, uh, yeah. many players like that anymore. I wonder why. I wonder if it's because of all the levels of the minor leagues and it just gets diluted, you know, or something. I don't know. But you're right. Like you don't have that, that want, desire. That player like has a role in the big leagues, like we talked about. But it's like you got to get there and be there for three, four years already right. before you're like, oh, that's that guy. Like he's that guy. Yeah, like, to f- this is what I tell people. Like if you come and watch me once, like you probably won't bat an eye. If you come back the next day, you might catch your attention, and then you come back the third day, you're like, okay, I like this guy. Right. You watch me for the fourth, fifth game in a row, you're like, I want that guy on my right. team. Yep. But it's you don't have your GM, you don't have your president often come to the minor league games, maybe for one game a yep. year, maybe two, one or two games a year. Yep. But, like, if you just watch consistently, like, 
You need guys. You need winners. Yeah. You need winners. That's frustrating, man. And and so kind of your journey is, right, you, you got drafted your senior year and you signed, and you made it up to AAA pretty quick. The big leagues relatively quick, all that. And now you're kind of on that fighting for the right team, right, the right yeah. fit and all that. Talk to me a little bit about some of the crazy stories that you've dealt. We caught, talked on the field the other day yeah. about a few of them. And it's just like I had some crazy stories, but some of the ones that you're going through are probably even, even crazier too, just different teams and organizations. Yeah, I mean, you dream your whole life about getting called up, and that moment was really cool for me, uh, and getting to call my parents and everybody and, and tell them that was everything that I imagined it to be and more. Yeah. Um, and you, I get called up, and I'm up for a few days and get called right back down, which I was okay with. Like, that's fine. Like, I, when I now make money. Yeah. I'm, my salary yep. for every different. I made a debut. I can say that I made it. Yep. Um. So I was good, and I played for, like, the next month, and it's like I played not to get DFA'd. Right. So you were I, in Memphis? You went right back down to Memphis? Right back yeah. down to Memphis. <clears throat> and I wasn't playing great because I felt like every day I was playing for my job. Like, I was like, okay, well, I'm up. I'm on the 40-man now. I'm one injury away, but, like, I don't want to play bad where I'm going to get DFA'd, and then if I play bad and get DFA'd, nobody's going to want me. So I was dealing with that for a month, and you can't play like that. I think that was my career for three years, dog. Yeah, I'm being so dead you serious. Know exactly, <laughs> you know exactly what, I, what I'm saying. I like, made my debut, and I won – the game and I got sent down that night family friends everything they're like they're like it's part of the job I'm like you can't even let me stay one day my family's here I got to drive tonight like I'm like what the fuck yeah it's awful it's so crazy uh, <clears throat> I was lucky to be up there for a few days and then the next month was just like playing not to get DFA'd and I was like every day it was like oh for four I'm like well, I'm there it done. is yeah there it is and that's like two days into it um and I didn't and I wasn't familiar with the whole process and like the business of it yet. Yeah, yeah. Like I just knew getting DFA'd was bad, which right. it's, it's really not. It's not that bad. Yeah, it's not. And it's sometimes bad. it's actually a fucking sometimes blessing. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I, did, I knew nothing. Yeah. I was so innocent when it comes to the business side. This And this was this year, man. Yeah. Because I'd never experienced, never been up, never experienced it. It had always been still fun. Right. Uh, then eventually a bunch of guys are coming off the 60 day. They're making some moves. I get the call. I'm DFA'd. And I'm like, well, there's my career. Yeah. Not knowing how the process right, right, went. Right. But your initial thoughts. I was like, they don't care about yeah. me. And we were in Charlotte. And then three days later, we had no expectation to get uh, picked up. Yeah. So what happened? So what did you, you couldn't be with the team, right? Can't so be with the team. I'm you just literally have to sit in the hotel. In the hotel so you guys myself. are in the road on Charlotte, in Charlotte. And you're just like, all right, not I'm just sitting here waiting for my career to like. Not that, allowed to go to the field. That's so, that's the thing that's so crazy that people don't understand. You're a fucking professional baseball player, all this shit. You're sitting in a hotel room on the road in Charlotte, just waiting for someone to tell you, hey, you're still on the roster or you're on this other team. Go here, do it this. It could be in 24 hours <laughs> or it could be in seven days. <laughs> That's insane. I didn't know I it was had, seven days. No, I think it's up to seven days if they do the whole try to trade. Oh, and my God. That's right. Because in three days, they have to make a claim. Then they got to figure out. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, my so God. So I, I was told it could be up to seven days. And I was like, oh, my. So what do I do? So, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So just hang out in the hotel, walk around Charlotte. It's a nice city, which it is. It Charlotte's is. Charlotte's dope. Dope. Well, at least it was Charlotte. Yeah. Um, I would have been doing some day drinking at the bar. And then so, the, <laughs> dude, I was so... <laughs> I was so sad. I got so drunk those nights. Yeah, like, I, was, I, was, I would have yeah, been in a so dark sad. place, bro. I was so sad because I just didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to wait here. Like, the team's leaving Sunday to go back to Memphis. I'm, I'm going to catch a flight to Memphis. Yeah. So it's Sunday now afternoon and a few hours before my flight. And I get a call, and it's our farm director. He's like, hey, Kramer, well, I just want to, sorry to inform you, you've been picked up by the Atlanta Braves. Dude, I felt like I got drafted. Here. Yeah, exactly. You were like, sorry to inform me. I'm out, motherfucker. I was like, yeah. Somebody want like somebody yeah. claim me. That means somebody wants me. Yep. Like, I was like, wow, I'm wanted. Like, yep. yeah, this is awesome, man. Yep. Uh, so I flew from Charlotte to Memphis, packed up my entire apartment at like 2 a.m., yep. woke up at 7, drove to Atlanta or Gwinnett, just outside yep. of Atlanta, which was seven or eight hours, parked at the stadium. The bus was, team bus was waiting on me, jumped on the bus. Oh God. And then we bust five hours to Jacksonville, and I was in the lineup the next day. <laughs> I had to wake up and do a physical at like 8 a.m. with the doctor and everything. And then I was in the lineup, but didn't have any of my baseball stuff because my baseball stuff was in Charlotte because I wasn't allowed to go to the field. Right. Oh so my all God. of my bats, my gloves, my underside, cleats, tights, cup, everything was in Charlotte. And I told them, I was like, can you guys mail this yeah, to yeah. Uh, Jacksonville because that's where I'm going to be? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, sure. So I show up to the field in Jacksonville. Nothing. Nothing I'm in the. I'm leading off yeah. playing short or second, and I'm like, 
Well, got to go to Dick's. Okay, what do I do? <laughs> no, I'm like at the field. We got BP in an hour. <laughs> I know none of these guys. Yeah. So I'm like going around the clubhouse, and luckily, luckily, it was an unbelievably cool team. Uh, in the end, yeah. I, but I didn't know at the time, so I'm like going around. I was like, Does anybody have an extra glove? <laughs> uh, I got some cleat? extra cleats. <laughs> And I was like asking the club, I was like, can y'all go on the home side? Like, just get me some tights. Yeah, cup something. And a jock, basic, something. yeah. Bro, I had something from everybody in that clubhouse. I, like, had a bat, random bats for the first two games there before my stuff came in. Dude, that is so That fun. was a wild experience on its own. Played great as well as I possibly could the next month with Atlanta. Like, I have no regrets. And that's that. this is really when I learned the process of being DFA'd is not because they don't like you. Yeah. Because it's the best I've played in my career it was my time with Atlanta. Um and we were in Nashville, had a night game on Sunday, played in it, got back to Gwinnett at 4 a.m. We had a flight the next day to Norfolk, Virginia. So I was going to sleep in and because we got in so late. And I got a call at like noon. I was like, hey, Kramer, this is so-and-so with the New York Mets. Welcome. Welcome. We're so excited to have you. I, I'm asleep. I'm like, yeah, what? <laughs> I'm like, the Mets? I play for the Braves. Got the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Oh no, you, we claimed you off of waivers today from the Met, uh, from the Braves. Welcome to the New York Mets. Somebody will be in touch soon." I'm like, wait. And then, the, and then the Braves call me like, "Hey, yeah, yeah. you've been we DFA'd you." I was like, "I played last night. I just woke up." I was like, "How does it happen that fast?" <laughs> so I was like, well, "Whatever." So got in my car, drove 14 hours to uh, Syracuse, New York. <laughs> Still don't have my baseball stuff because my, my baseball stuff is mm -hmm. on its way to Norfolk. Yeah. That they put on the bus. So, again, new team. And I'm like, hey, guys. <laughs> oh, I, I kind of know this song and dance already because I had to do it. <laughs> I don't have <laughs> a glove or cleats or anything. Y'all got anything? So, for two days in a row in Syracuse, I had to use random guys' stuff again. And then, actually, with the Mets, I was caught up and down a few times. And then – um I loved that organization yeah, too. Yeah. Love the Braves, love the Mets. They treated me really well, like my teammates. Just finally started making friends with everybody. I'm on deck in Lehigh Valley, and my manager calls me back in. He's like, "Hey, hey, you gotta come out. It's the day of the trade deadline." <laughs> and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> He's like, uh, "You're going to the big leagues, but uh, you gotta hurry up now. It's an 11 a.m. It was an 11 a.m. game we're in. It's like, but you gotta hurry. You got an Uber waiting on you. It's a four and a half hour Uber from here to the stadium in D.C. Like, hurry up now." So I go straight from Lehigh Valley to the stadium, get there at like 6.40 for yeah. a 7 o'clock game. It was DeGrom's first game back, so it was packed. And I get there, and I'm back in the big leagues. Yeah. And two days later, Buck calls me in the office, and he's like, hey, we're um, – Oh, my God. We got to designate you. We got this guy coming off. We got this guy coming off, and we traded for two guys. Like, we want to keep you. We value you. We like your skill set a lot. We just – it's a numbers game. We don't yeah. have enough numbers right yeah. now. We're going to try to get you through waivers, get back to Syracuse. If anybody goes down, you're our next guy oh you're coming up. God. And I was like, great. I like the organization. Clear. Yeah, fine. I'll yeah. clear waivers. Like, I'm in a yeah. great situation here, like <laughs> first place team. And I, if something happens, like, I'll be up. So I didn't have anywhere to go. I'm in D.C. They're flying to somewhere. I wasn't allowed to go back to Syracuse. So I fly back to Baton Rouge and – <laughs> Hang out with Joe for like four or five days, which was <laughs> awesome to have him awesome, in the yeah. middle of the season. Yeah. But while we're here, um, I wake up to a call and it's Billy. I, th I don't know if it was Billy, the GM, but it was somebody with the Mets. And, hey, man, I'm so sorry. Like, we thought we were going to be able to sneak you through waivers, but uh, you got claimed. Just wanted to let you know how much we like you. Uh, maybe down the road we can link back up. Like, we, we really like your skill set. I was like, awesome, man. Yeah, uh, I really liked it too. Who did I get claimed by? Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, the St. Louis Cardinals. I said, the Cardinals? <laughs> I was like, I was just with them. Yeah. I was like, a few months ago, they let me go. Yeah. I was like, I don't know. Take it up with them. <laughs> so, I guess the Cardinals, it wasn't how I thought originally when the Cardinals let me go. Like, oh, we're done with him. I don't right, want right. him. Because that's how I thought the process was. And yeah. it's just not like that at all. Like, they just they don't saw, have the numbers. Right. And when they did have the numbers, you were on waivers. They are like, that's our right. guy. So they claimed me back. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, I want to be I wanted. I just didn't know you guys wanted me. But great. Like, I'll play for anybody. Yeah. And so now I'm going back to Memphis. But I was like, I'm in Baton Rouge. Memphis team is in Jacksonville. And my car is in Syracuse. Like, can you guys give me, like, just three or four days to figure this out? Which yeah. I really just wanted to hang out with Joe a little longer in Baton Rouge. 
Um, so I flew one of my good buddies to Syracuse. Yeah. Paid him, yeah. paid him a good amount of money to drive my my car back down to Baton Rouge, and then waited for the team to get back in Memphis. And I drove up to Memphis, and that's where I finished the year. That is that's exhausting story. That, it's, it's exhausting listening, like yeah. just thinking about all the moving parts, the logistics, family, friends, like. And I didn't have a house. Three, like so I was living, that three, four teams, four. Four, three this, organizations, yeah. but back to another yeah. one. Four and moves. Then up and down. I went up and down a good bit with the Mets. Like I was up for a few series, like on taxi, and then I was active, and yep. then I was DFA'd. But bro, utility players and relief pitchers, like that shit is nuts. Like it's a blessing and a curse. You can play all these positions, and you're yep. very versatile. But it's like now that means you can go so many different places. Oh, dude, I lived in a hotel out of the same suitcase from when I got. DFA'd with the Braves until the end of the summer. I was that that's the shit people don't know about with the <laughs> that, that got expensive too. Yeah, bro, living in a hotel every <laughs> night because they're not once you're once you're on that roster, they're not paying for they're not paying for your living yeah. anymore. So yeah, yeah, that got expensive quick, but it was um it was wild, and people don't see that that yeah. side of it, bro. Like people think like, oh, you made it to the big leagues, what a good year, right? It was a good year, but yeah. it was, dude, I've never been more exhausted after a season. Like I just came home for the last month and did nothing. Just mentally exhausted, right? Mentally. Where, like you, you're somewhere where you can put your feet on the ground, unpack right. your bags. You can just sit down and not have to be anywhere for anybody. Right. On other people's dimes, time, all that shit. Like I'm telling you, the first month back every year was like the best month ever. Yep. So I'm happy that you're that you're at least in that that phase now. Yeah, but now I'm starting to finally like get that itch to like, all right, yeah. I'm, I in next year, like, yeah. okay, like next year is gonna be the yeah. best year I've had. So, like, I'm starting to feel that itch again. Like, I've done – I'm not going to stop going out and having a good time. It's my off season, But, like, right. I am at least starting to get over the edge. Like, okay, like, it's kind of it's kind of time to start locking in. So, um, that's where I'm at right now. But, yeah, man, it was – That's a it wild was, It was a mentally a grind. That's a wild year. Yeah. Well, damn. Well, we're going to have to uh, – I'm probably going to let you go here in a minute. But um, we're going to have to catch up after next year, hopefully. But what's – What's the organization's plans with you this year? Like, have they given you kind of a layout? Like, hey, look, this is what we see for you this year? Or just come ready to play? Just basically come ready to play. Like, you're right there. Like, yeah. if somebody goes down, or I don't know what moves they're going to make in the offseason. Right, you right. never know with free agency. You never know uh, with any of that. But, like, I'm right there. So I'll go to spring big league spring training in uh, February. And my goal is I'm going to go in there and be like, hey, I'm one of, like, I'm as good as, I'm as, good as these guys. Like, Give me a chance. Don't yep. don't give me the eye test. Yeah. Because I'm a dog and I'm a winner. Yeah. And if you guys will just give me a chance, like, you'll see. Yeah. And I have no doubts. Like, I, I have no, like, once you get there, like, it kind of solidifies, like, in your head, like, yeah, that guy? Yeah. That guy? All right. Oh, it's when I turn the TV on right now, I'm like, this guy, I'm like, and no disrespect. No like, disrespect that's, to yeah, them. But it's like, if they can do it, I, yep. I'm like, bro. No, if I just did this, did that, like, stayed in the, like, that's why, bro. I said, I, I've said this to a bunch of people in here and, and throughout baseball. I think you're going to be a 10-year big leaguer, bro. Like, it's about finding the right, look at Aaron, uh, Austin Nola, right? Like, right. bro, that's, it's just about finding the right fit, the right situation. And you have the skill set, like you said, the mindset, the chip on your shoulder. You're a winner. You're going to be, I'm excited for your career, dude. I'm happy you Appreciate finally it. got up there. All, yeah. Just all those things this year, like, just. I'm taking notes. I, I feel it. I'm putting it right here on my shoulder. Like, all right, yep. I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll yep. show this org. Yep. You shouldn't have let me go. You shouldn't have let me yep. go. It's the same thing when it'll you kept happen. the text messages. Yeah. You got the receipts, it'll, bro. It'll That's it. it. It'll happen. And, yep. and I can't wait for that day because I, I kept, kept the receipts. Yep. And it's going to be like, we're going to look up in four years and be like, oh, remember that shit that you went through? It's the same thing at LSU, right? Your junior, senior year, all that shit. It's like, remember all that shit we went through? I went through it for a reason and stuff. Yeah, and I now it's here. It be, builds character. My my path has never been, with sports yeah. has never been easy. Yep. And I don't I don't want it to be. So, yeah. makes the story better. Absolutely. Well, dude, I I didn't think we were gonna talk this long. I truly truly appreciate you like going into detail of all this stuff. Like I feel like I could talk for with you about this forever because this, this was your life for so long. That's what I mean. So, like you know. Yeah, and it's like I feel like you're just I relate so much to it, and I can I I remember exactly those things like. All the things, like, dude, I, I think I told somebody the story. I won my first three MLB games, dude. and I got sent down the same day on all three. And you had three days of service time. Three days of service That's time. outrageous. Think about that. Like, it's nuts. I'm like, a starting pitcher should get five days minimum, like, you if should, you go make a start. You should have 15 days there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. For it was bullshit. So I would go make my start, get sent down, get called up, get sent down, win, get sent down. The third time, I, I literally walked into the office. Like, it was John Farrell, and I was like, John, I'm not going down. He was like, 
yeah, you are. And I was like, what do I have to do? Yeah, I was like, tell me what I have to do. I'm three and oh, like, what do I have to do? And he's like, it's a numbers game, man. It's a business. I'm sorry. I think they've got more <clears throat> rules now with the new CBA of how many times you can go up and down in a year. Okay. I think they do. They need to, especially just, for you guys, for you and relief pitchers. Like that was the craziest shit. Dude. It was crazy. But dude, thank you. I appreciate it. We'll yeah, definitely it. do this again next year after, uh, hopefully you'll have a nice year sure. up there. It'll be good. Um, but again, thank you, dude. This was really fun and a long time coming. Yeah. So appreciate you. Enjoyed it. Yep. For sure.